thrilled to have Dr. Stephen Brown, Dr. Mark Bleschner, and Dr. Deirdre Barrett to talk about all things sleep and dreaming. Dr. Stephen Brown is, um, he, after under, undergraduate research in yeast and genetics and graduate studies on chromatin biochemistry at Harvard, he moved to Geneva for postdoctoral work where he first studied biological clocks and sleep in the laboratory of Yuli Schreibler. His laboratory studies the molecular mechanisms and neural circuits underlying sleep and diurnal behavior using human cells and mouse models. Their studies of human cells recently culminated in cellular GWAS studies to show how common regulatory variation affects human daily behavior. And their mouse studies have led to the discovery of novel causes of human intellectual disability and have shown how sleep and circadian influences cooperate to regulate synaptic dynamics. Dr. Brown and his team have also pioneered the use of metabolomics to study circadian function, including an exhaled breath. So I will hand it over to you, Stephen. So thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be virtually back in Boston. I wish I could really be back in Boston. I come from uh, not far away in Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, but anyhow, uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I dreamed of flying recently, but unfortunately, panelists can't vote. Uh, I'm now going to share my screen uh, and move this up. So hopefully you can now see my screen. And uh, what I'll be talking about are sleep, wake, and dreams, uh, not only in men, but also in model organisms like mice, which are much more similar uh, to us uh, than you might imagine. So, I think all of us can agree uh, that the baby in this picture uh, is sleeping. A slightly more difficult question is, is this mouse uh, sleeping? Uh, and indeed, you can see the little twitches that it has. Uh, perhaps uh, it's also dreaming, and that is a question we'll be addressing. Uh, but it can get harder than that, uh, because what about these flies? Uh, the one on the upper left is moving, the others aren't. Uh, are they sleeping? Uh, and are they dreaming? If you look at the flies at a different time of day, which will happen in a moment, they're all moving, so they're not dead. But are they sleeping? Uh, and are they dreaming? And finally, how about this creature? Uh, is it sleeping? Uh, here I must admit I'm messing with you a bit. That's a photograph, uh, which is why it's so motionless. But the reason that I'm mentioning that is this is a hydra, the most uh, simple organism that we think actually sleeps. Uh, it doesn't even have a brain. It has a nerve net instead. So all of this is saying that somehow uh, there must be some universal characteristics of sleep uh, that we can uh, get at. Uh, so what might these be? Uh, one of them is a distinct posture. Even a fly, when it goes to sleep, uh, lowers its head and curls up a little bit. So you can watch this the next time a fly is on your window. Uh, fish go to the bottom of the cage and hide a little bit. Uh, a worm uh, stops being wriggly and kind of goes straight and sticks its head up in the air. Uh, this is so virtually all animals that sleep have some kind of posture. They all have a reduced environmental awareness. Uh, if you poke them, uh, they don't move as much. Uh, and finally, they have what we call homeostatic regulation. The less sleep you get, uh, the more sleep you want. And so in this way, we think of sleep as a two process model. Why do we sleep? Uh, we sleep because it's nighttime. That's your biological clock speaking. The last time you went to a different time zone and couldn't go to sleep, uh, that is influence of your clock on sleep. And the second, because you're tired, so-called sleep homeostasis. So do flies really sleep uh, though? Uh, 
What I can tell you is that the same drugs that affect your sleep also affect sleep in uh, the model organisms I've mentioned. Uh, caffeine keeps them awake. Uh, benzodiazepines, uh, Z drugs like Zolpidem uh, put them to sleep. And genetic mutations in shared genes that affect your sleep also affect their sleep. All of this to suggest that they're sleeping in much the same way uh, that you are. If we turn to mammals such as yourselves, you can start to divide sleep into different stages. Uh, you've probably heard of rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, uh, as well as non-REM or deep sleep. It used to be thought that REM sleep is dream sleep. Uh, in fact, uh, we can now say that dreams happen in both non-REM and REM sleep. But these different sleep stages are characterized by specific neural oscillations. Uh, so during sleep, as you might expect, the electromusculogram, the measure of whether you're moving, goes uh, relatively silent. And at the same time, your brain waves, the electroencephalogram, measured by electrodes stuck to your skull, start showing these rather large waves. So what exactly are these waves? They're reflecting underlying neural synchrony. So you can think of neurons as miniature magnets as they're firing. And it happens that all of the neurons in your cortex and the mouse cortex, uh, most of them are relatively neatly arranged in rows. And so when they're all doing the same thing, this creates a summed dipole that creates a deviation in the electroencephalogram. So when you see these big waves happening as you sleep, you're actually looking at whole populations of neurons that are firing in synchrony, being silent in synchrony, and so on. So what are these sleeps and waves useful for? Uh, on the one hand, at a fundamental biochemical level, the state of sleep is facilitating cellular rebuilding processes involved in memory. Uh, my lab studies that uh, quite a lot, and we published a lot about it, but I'm not really going to say a lot more about that because our main topic here is dreaming. And here, what I want to suggest is that the sleep oscillations I've just discussed uh, are facilitating uh, the way your brain organizes information. And I'll be describing the right half of this slide uh, in a couple of moments. But basically, these sleep oscillations uh, are where dreaming comes in. So what do I mean uh, by that? So as I mentioned, as we go to sleep, uh, our brain waves gradually organize and become larger amplitude as we sleep deeper and deeper into sleep uh, before becoming something completely different in frequency during REM sleep. Uh, and that's reflecting this cortical organization. What we think is happening there is that these waves are facilitating the transfer of information uh, from one part of the brain to another. Uh, your short-term memories are temporarily stored in a place called the hippocampus, somewhere down underneath the corpus, uh, beneath the cortex, and subsequently they're transferred to the neocortex for more long-term storage. And these different waves that I've talked about are reactivating your memories and helping them be transferred. And at the same time they're being reactivated, you can change uh, their emotional valence, you can add content, uh, you can change the way you perceive them. And in this way, when you dream about something, you are fundamentally uh, modifying and adding emotional content uh, to the memory itself. So at the simplest level, this is what dreams are. You'll hear a more complicated explanation of what dreams are from the other speakers. But for me, it is the movement of memories uh, from one place to another. And this requires their reactivation. So basically, as you alternate between slow wave sleep and uh, or non-REM sleep and REM sleep, you're facilitating communication between hippocampus and cortex, 
and you are strengthening this representation in the cortex or perhaps changing it. So how can I actually prove this to you? I'll do this in my last few slides. First, by showing you a mouse dream. And then I'll use this dream to create a false memory in the mouse of something that never happened. So in order to do that, I need to introduce you to the concept of place cells uh, first. So what you'll be seeing here is a mouse moving around its cage. And every time the neuron at the red arrow fires, there'll be a red dot. And so what you can see as this mouse starts moving, uh, speed it up, of course, is that every time it's in one spot in its cage, that particular neuron uh, is firing. That neuron is indicating that place. If we put the mouse in a maze, you can identify place cells all along the way. So you can see the purple cells in the top of the maze, then the yellow, uh, et cetera. And so basically these cells firing in exactly that sequence correspond in this mouse to a memory of moving through that maze. So now the cool thing, if we now consider those waves I told you about and look for these sequences of replays, what we can actually see uh, is on the forward end of these waves, a forward replay of that memory, and on the back side of these waves, a backward replay of that memory. So basically, these waves are reactivating during sleep uh, these memories. And now we can do one additional experiment here. So we can let a mouse explore a cage and we can identify the place cells within that cage. Here you can see five of them identified. And now while the mouse is sleeping, we can pair one of these place cells with a stimulus, be it favorable or unfavorable. So here we've stimulated uh, the reward center of the ventral tegmental area, so the thing that makes you feel good. And so every time the mouse goes through a dream wandering past that place cell four, we stimulate the reward center. And now when the mouse wakes up, rather than wandering around that cage, as it did before, it moves straight over to the field of that place cell and spends all its time exploring that hoping to find a reward that never actually happened. So we have in this way given the mouse a favorable dream about that particular place. So what I hope you'll take from this brief talk uh, is that the state of sleep in general is facilitating memory-related rebuilding and that the sleep oscillations that are happening in your brain as you are dreaming are facilitating memory-related uh, storage and changing of valence. And this literally is such stuff as dreams are made on, as Shakespeare said. Thanks very much, uh, and we, I'm happy to take your questions at a later time. Thank you so much, Stephen. That's fascinating. Um, yes, just a reminder to everyone that if you have questions for Stephen or Mark or Deirdre as we go through their talks, please submit them in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will uh, get to as many questions as we can after the conclusion of all three talks. Um, okay, and uh, next up is Dr. Mark Bleschner. Dr. Mark Bleschner is a psychologist and psychoanalyst in New York City and a professor at New York University. As founder and director of the White Institute's HIV clinical service, he led the first psychoanalytic clinic devoted to working with people with AIDS, their relatives and caregivers. He received his doctorate from Yale University where he also studied music and language perception. His dissertation included the serendipitous finding that one third of the population cannot perceive the difference between major and minor triads. Besides his practice of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, he also leads several dream groups. So, uh, Mark, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today about how dreams allow us to create new thoughts and ideas, what I call extralinguistic thoughts, thoughts that cannot be expressed in language. As you heard, I'm a practicing psychoanalyst, and so I hear dreams all day, not in every hour, but often. And this has given me a chance to study the special kinds of thinking that occur in dreams and what people's attitudes are to their own dreams. And over time, I've identified certain kinds of dream constructions that tell us a great deal about how the mind brain works when we're awake and when we're asleep. Today, I'm going to tell you about just one type of those extra linguistic dream constructions, which I call interobjects. With interobjects, people report a dream in which there was something between an X and a Y, something new that was somehow in between two recognizable objects. Alan Hobson dreamt of a piece of hardware, something like the lock of a door or perhaps a pair of paint frozen hinges. What does something like that look like? I'll show you pictures of the two prototypes, a lock and a paint frozen hinge. Sorry, one minute. Uh, what is sim something between those two objects? Isn't that a weird combination? They're both metal hardware. They're both involved in keeping a door open or shut. The hinge should be able to move, but it has been frozen by paint. The lock can allow movement or prevent it, depending on how you set it. Interobjects are one example of the way dreams allow us to have extralinguistic thoughts, thoughts that extend beyond the bounds of language. We need language to communicate our thoughts from one person to another, but language is also very constraining of thought. Dreams allow us to supersede the constraints of language. Dreams allow us to think things that are unspeakable. And I mean unspeakable here, not only with its connotation of something taboo, but more literally as something that cannot be spoken because it is not expressible with words. You can feel this breakout from linguistic thought in many interobjects. For example, here's another uh, interobject from Bert States, who dreamt of something between a swimming pool and an aqueduct. Again, I can show you the two prototypes of a pool and an aqueduct, but I don't have a picture that captures something between them. It looks like the dream suggests a category of object. A pool and an aqueduct both contain water. Both are man-made, and there may be other ways that they're connected. Now, sometimes people tell you a dream and say, you know, I had the most bizarre dream last night. But when people report a dream with an interobject, most of the time, they don't think it's bizarre. They seem to understand intuitively that interobjects are just something that happens in dreams. You could call it a commonplace bizarreness of dreaming. Interobjects are related to category formation. We all organize the world into categories, although just how we form those categories is a subject of much psychological research, and dreams show us forming new categories. When we were children, we would ask, animal, vegetable, or mineral? We were excited that the whole universe could be organized into those three categories. The interobjects show the mind grain creating new categories based on different properties of the objects, and these categories can be quite novel. A patient of Donald Meltzer dreamt of something between a phonograph and a balance scale. Two objects that both have a round metal platter and an adjacent metal bar? That's not a category most of us are familiar with, and we don't have a name for it but the dreaming mind brain can notice common groups of features that the waking mind might not pay attention to. The results of this dream creativity can be seen throughout our culture. An interobject dream may have been the source of the composite figures of mythology that cross species. For example, the Sphinx was made out of a human head, a lion's body, and an eagle's wings. Here's an Egyptian version of the Sphinx, and here's a Greek version of the Sphinx. We also have the Minotaur, which was half man and half bull. Here's an ancient 
representation of the Minotaur. And here's a modern version, a Minotaur action figure. And here is a lithograph from 2006 by the Chinese artist Wei Min Zhang of a Minotaur's relative, a mixture of horses and men. As you can see, the Minotaur and similar composite creatures have had lasting power in many cultures and in different time periods. You may have already noticed that with most of the intro objects I've told you about, the percept is between two things, and both of those things come from the same category of animal, vegetable, or mineral. Is that a rule of inter-object formation? I think not really. One of my patients dreamt of a cell phone baby, and that's one of my favorite object, inter-objects. People seem to get the connection immediately between cell phones and babies, even if they never noticed the connection before. Most cell phones and babies are small objects that we hold close to our bodies. We speak softly to them, and at times, completely to our surprise and embarrassment, they make loud noises that disturb other people. We don't have a word in English for this category, but that doesn't stop the dream process from creating the category anyway. If you go back to the animal-vegetable-mineral distinction, a baby is animal and a cell phone is technically mineral but maybe unconsciously we experience our cell phones as if they are living things, and so we can dream of a cell phone baby. Interestingly, children can be more accepting than adults about retaining the integrity of an inter-object. A child dreamt that a seal swam up to him and his friends. The child said, in the dream, we thought it was just a seal, but then we looked, and under the water, it was a whole boat. It was huge, and so we climbed onto the seal boat, and it brought us to shore. When the boy told his father the dream in the morning, the father said to him, so really, it was a boat, a big safe boat. The child said, it was a boat, but it was still a big friendly seal. The father thought that he needed to teach his son proper reality testing, and his son was sticking with the integrity of what he actually dreamt. But if inter-objects are unacceptable in adult discourse, that does not mean they have no use. These inter-objects may have an elementary function in human thought that needs to be explored more. By violating our usual category boundaries, they can be crucial in the formation of really new ideas that would be harder to come by using only fully formed rational thoughts. And you'll notice that the seal is animal and the boat is mineral. So once again, the animate-inanimate distinction seems to be able to be crossed if the inanimate object moves independently or is somehow lifelike. Interobjects may be an example of thought mutations, original ideas perhaps created randomly. In fact, creating new ideas may be one of the functions of dreaming. I call this the theory of Oniric Darwinism. Oniric means related to dreaming, and Darwinism relates to Darwin's model of random variation and selection for fitness. Dreams create thought mutations, new categories and new combinations. Some of these mutations may not be particularly useful to the dreamer. These can be discarded and forgotten. But some dream mutations have survival value. They're of use to the dreamer, and sometimes to the culture at large. Our mind brains can then retain these mutations and combinations to produce new kinds of thought, imagination, and self-awareness. We dream each night at least five times, and we don't remember most of those dreams. What happens with those dreams? Are they used psychologically or creatively? We don't know. Oniric Darwinism suggests that even when we don't consciously remember the dreams, we may still use them. If the thought mutations are retained as useful, we may rediscover them while awake. They may feel like an out of the blue inspiration and we may never recognize their original source in our dreams. Sometimes we may have a sense of deja vu. We feel we've encountered these things before, but we cannot recollect where. Leonardo da Vinci liked interobjects. 
He considered that imagination is based on the ability to recombine images or parts of images into entirely new compounds or ideas. And since I first wrote about interobjects, several artists have contacted me with an interest in adapting this dream process into their artworks. One visual artist from Norway, Maja Hofstad Gunes, created a series of artworks based on interobjects that she showed in Japan called Collision of Species Oniric Darwinism. She produced videos of one species transitioning to another species. I don't have the videos, but here are two still images from the show. And you can see how these two prototypes of the octopus and the bee, you try to imagine that they kept morphing into one another. And here's another one of her works. This one is untitled. You could say it's like an interobject, something between a moss and a woman. One last thing. You've heard me say the word mind brain several times in this talk. It may be new to you. 400 years ago, Rene Descartes proposed the distinction between the mind and brain, but modern science has questioned that dualism. It's a good example of the way language can limit thought. When we say brain, we mean the bodily organ. When we say mind, we mean the collection of mental processes and faculties. But many of us are becoming more and more uncomfortable with this division. The aim of modern neuroscience is to be able to account for mental events in terms of neurobiological processes and vice versa, so that ultimately we may understand them as unitary or integral phenomena. So more and more scientists started to try to join these two words together, but they did so with hesitation. You can see many examples of this in the scientific literature. People write mind hyphen brain, or even mind slash brain, or even Jacques Ponsep wrote mind brain with a capital B in the middle of the word. People kept avoiding the final leap of just combining mind and brain into a single word. And so after delivering about Deliber deliberating about this for a long time, I finally put them together into one word, mind brain. Try it out. Your spell checker may reject it now, but I think it will become part of the language of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was great. Um, again, a reminder to everyone out there, if you have questions for Mark or Stephen or upcoming for Deirdre, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Deirdre Barrett. Deirdre Barrett is a psychologist at Harvard where she teaches courses on dreams. She is the former president of IASD and the Society for Psychological Hypnosis. She has written five books, including her most recent, Pandemic Dreams, and she is the editor of four more, including Trauma and Dreams. She is also editor in chief of IASD's journal, Dreaming. For the past four years, she has been making digital art based on her dreams and is represented by Keep Contemporary Gallery in San Antonio. Her work has appeared in shows around the United States and won second prize in the International Association for the Study of Dreams exhibition in 2017. Her artwork has served as the backdrop to our promotional materials for this event. So you've already seen some of it and you're about to see a lot more. So I will hand it over to you, Deirdre. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, lovely to be here with you. Um, Mark's talk makes a perfect uh, backdrop to uh, what I'm going to talk about because I, I've done lots and lots of dream research and clinical work with dream, but, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about. I'm wearing my art hat today. Um, but the sort of inner objects and blends that, that Mark was talking about are exactly what fascinates me about trying to reproduce images from the dream world. So I've been working in dreams my whole life, but I never thought of myself as an artist. Uh, some of my writings are about dreams and creativity, especially in the visual arts. 
but I used to maybe every two or three years, I'd wake up from a dream that had such a compelling visual image. And it often was one of those hybrid settings or hybrid creatures, as Mark was just talking about. And I'd try to reproduce it. I'd sketch or I'd run out and buy a cheap set of watercolors. And I just don't have the eye-hand coordination. So it was always an exercise in frustration. I looked like a six-year-old had drawn the thing and it didn't capture the dream image at all. So about four and a half years ago, I just happened to have gone to a friend's digital photography exhibit, very heavily digitally manipulated. Um, photographs. And they're not at all like what I ended up doing. They're very geometric. But unlike most art shows that I like, I always think, oh, I wish I could do that. Um, but at, at this one, I sort of thought, oh, I bet I could do that. I'm pretty good at photography. I'm pretty good with computers. Hmm. But I didn't really intend to. But then just a couple nights later, I had one of these dreams with a really, really compelling image. And so for the first time when I woke up from the dream, I didn't think of sketching or, or trying to draw or paint it. I thought of the, the photographs and digital manipulations. And I thought I already have lots of photographs of masks. I collect them, they're on my walls, I go to mask shows. Um, and this mask looked kind of Northwest Salish type. So I went back through photos I already had and I found a mask that looked quite a bit like it. Um, and in the dream, the mask was on the wall and at first it was just a mask. But then I noticed that it had a little creatures climbing up the side of it and it had whole cities and architecture on it and in the dream i kept thinking oh i hadn't noticed this oh i hadn't noticed this but of course the things were appearing as other things disappeared but i didn't realize that in the dream and then at some point the mask opened its eyes and i mean awake i would call that coming to life but in the dream i thought oh he was only sleeping he woke up uh, was what had happened so I, I'd heard of Deep Dream, which had fascinated me conceptually. It's a program that some people at Google put out, and it scans lots and lots of images, and then you get it to try to recognize images off things that it's learned. So you can train it on nothing but buildings or nothing but furry animals or nothing but birds or nothing but abstract geometric objects. Um, so they named it Deep Dream because I think it's doing something very similar to at least what our visual cortex is during dreaming, which is to take all the visual images that it's seen and to begin to imagine and construct things from that particular background of images. We, to some extent, are using our whole lives, um, but the more recent ones probably get dominance. But on the Deep Dream program, you can erase its memory of images and, and then give it only one set. So this is the first time that I woke up from a dream and I got a photograph and I started manipulating it. It trained, trained some deep dream versions to create some of the creatures I'd seen, but also just did some digital collaging in of the, I want, the eyes looked very realistic, not fantastic in the dream. So I thought, wow, this, this works. And I actually played around a lot because it was so constantly changing. It would take a long video to capture everything that the, uh, the piece of art did in the dream. So I, I took other masks that looked more like it. The female one there actually looks very little like the original mask, but almost all the others. Um, it just had more area for the kinds of creatures that were climbing and looking out from it. 
Um, so I did this whole series of masks, all basically from different moments in that same dream. And finally, to get it out of my system, it was always only one mask, but I made this totem pole of stacked faces with the different phenomena going on that were happening in the dream. And then the, the mask ones were all from old photos that I already had, and I was just learning to use Deep Dream and also a lot of Photoshopping. I draw on things a little bit when I just can't find a photographic image I want. And I also use a subprogram of Photoshop called Puppet Warp a lot. It lets you stretch photographic images. So you can do things like pin down the eyes or, um, or some part of the body shape, the whole head, that you want to be realistic. And then you pull other parts of the image out in all directions. So you can get something that's scaly or feathery or furry, but no longer looks at all like the shape of the original objects. And yet it has realistic texture and realistic eyes. So um, the next dream I had that was really compelling was that I was out in the middle of the night walking down to Harvard Square. I live very close to Harvard Square. And in the dream, it was deserted except, except for me. And I began to notice these little creatures up on the rooftops. And I thought, oh, they've lived there the whole time I've lived here. I've never noticed them. They've lived on the roofs all these years. And then gradually they began to come down into the street. So I was just wandering through the dream, entranced by these creatures, which in my dreaming mind decided that I'd never been in Harvard Square in the middle of the night. So that's why I hadn't seen them in the streets. I'm in Harvard Square in the middle of the night all the time. So I made two images from this one. Again, it would have taken a video to, to capture everything, but I just did two of my favorite buildings. The previous one was Charlie's Kitchen, and this, as many of you probably recognize, is the Harvard Lampoon Building. They're just the most fantastic buildings kind of before the dream on, on my walk into the square. And then I had a dream that I was in a jungle, and there were all these strange creatures. I, again, very much like Mark talks about of, of inner objects. Uh, mine, my dream creatures tend to be, say they're identifiable as a mammal, but not a specific one, or they look pretty much reptilian, but not a specific one. So this, this had lots of variety of those, and some were eating others, and some were dying, some were giving birth. It, it seemed like sort of the whole cycle of life in the jungle. And for this one, I at first couldn't find any um, photographs of trees and foliage that suited my jungle. So it's the only one that has a background that's not mainly photographic. I, I took a fractal program and created a fractal to look leafy and the right colors, but more abstracted than, uh, than a real photo would. I eventually found a background of jungly foliage that fit the dream pretty well. So when I made a second one, because for all these, they're, it's so constantly changing and I'm moving around that the dreams I really like, I tend to, to want to make more than one image of. So this is, the, this is the other one from that dream. And then I'm not going to tell you the plots of each dreams, but these these are some of the others that I did when I was still working largely with Deep Dream, which is, is the most dreamlike and I think the most genuinely artificial intelligence of, of the programs I interact with, but also a lot of Photoshopping and puppet warping. And then this is the first time I made a piece that's not directly one image from one dream. I just had lots of objects from dreams where it wasn't quite the whole image that I wanted. So I made this to represent the dream state. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to contradicting uh, Stephen's statement that, that dreams can happen outside REM too, but it just seemed like the most uh, whimsical way of um, open all night in a REM sleep and the 99 cent uh, toll to have a fantastic 
experience as just what the feel of the dream world. And then I've got images from about 12 different dreams there. And then I had a dream about something out in the asteroid belt that had developed life and was coming toward Earth. And it was sort of an asteroid with life on it. And it was sort of a spaceship that was being guided intelligently. Um, and it morphed around a lot. And at first I was out in space seeing it, um, but it kind of changed a lot. So I made two versions of that. And then also I was maybe even not later, but at the same time in a weird way, I was back on earth watching something coming in the distance. Uh, looking through these very distinctive windows. So when I started trying to make the windows from some program, uh, none of the ones I was using would create the windows very well, but this kaleidoscopic one did a pretty good job of it. So I made two versions of, of looking off at outer space. And then uh, this, uh, this was about two years ago when I started getting uh, further from the original images, I, it was more than I started having dreams that were so powerful emotionally that I wanted to make them and they didn't have a clear visual image. In this one, there was an animal that was nailed up to the side of a building or just a freestanding wall or barn. And, and it, was, it was slowly dying and it was furry, but it was sort of night and I couldn't even see it very well. Um, but in trying to think how to represent it, it was almost Easter time. And so I made this, um, some people interpret this as the devil. I meant it to be a kind of hideous dying Easter bunny. Um, and I titled it Non Resurrectus. But it's got more waking life concepts superimposed on it, but it still gives me that feel of this kind of horror about the monstrous but still sympathetic dying animal. And, um, and in, with this one I started experimenting with some other programs besides Deep Dream, just, just using Photoshop and its variations for how well they can do collages. You can just cut out things and, and fade layer things. And I, I dreamed about my mother's death. She actually died a year ago. And in November, I had this dream where I was first outside the church where her funeral took place. And there were lots of kind of ominous birds up in these trees over the church, which actually happens quite a bit there. And then I was in the church and she was attending church and I was guilty and sad and kind of horror stricken that she she looked perfectly fine but there was something horrifying about the fact that she was just still routinely coming to church even though she was dead and so I took a lot more liberties with I don't even have the church in here my mother's one piece of one face but my my great great grandmother is actually the figure on the left and I'm the figure on the right um, and even once I was in the church, the birds were the most ominous thing about it. So, so I put them all over the place. Um, and here's one more peek behind the scenes of, of what I tend to do. When looking for me threatened by the birds, I probably, there must be a million photos of me cringing, but they're the kind you throw out, not, you know tag carefully and save. So the one I could think of because it featured me afraid of birds is that one in the center. I put the one on the left up just to redeem the cockatoos of Sydney who are wonderful birds, but for one moment I was afraid of them. And I remembered that image. So I took that and took the cockatoos out and, and put the, the blackbirds from the dream in. And then the, some of the most recent things I've made are about dreams I had about the pandemic. Back in March, as it was just coming, I dreamed about being in a beautiful old fashioned library, but I knew that outside the window, something horrible was happening to the earth that seemed more like the Black Plague of centuries back. 
So it didn't make sense to make the library. That was not a feel of the dream. So I made this image of a plague doctor amid COVID particles that kind of captured the feel of what was outside, even though the, the curtains were drawn. So I never saw a visual image in this one. And then just about a week later, at the very end of March, um, as, as I was teaching my last class and shifting over to getting out of things and more worried for my students, some of whom were psychiatry residents getting reassigned to do COVID evals rather than getting to stay home. I had this dream where I was had to go outside, the air was toxic for some undefined reason, and I had to take my cat with me, and I was trying to get a kind of hood in the dream. It was just a sack over his head that was going to help him breathe. And he struggled with me and like he would if I'm trying to do something good for him. Um, but just at the end, I got the hood on him and I picked him up under one arm the way I carry him when I have to do things with the other arm and we headed out. And it wasn't like a happy ending, but it was like, okay, maybe things are gonna be okay. So I was actually looking for either pictures of cats and masks or masks that I could put over my cat and, um, and actually, I do a lot of sort of false starts, and although that that does justice to my real life cat much better than than what I ended up with, didn't capture the dream feeling of of the toxicity or or why I was putting something on him. So I came across this picture of a lamb in a gas mask, and um, and collage this a little more simply than, than I usually do. But the lamb is kind of just the size of my cat. Uh, the carry is just what I did with him. And this one really captured that feel. So I just want to mention if people are interested in seeing more of this, my website is deirdrebearatallstrongtogether.com. Uh, and there's obviously off to the right an art section. And uh, also uh, at Instagram, I'm Deirdre underscore Barrett underscore dreams. And the Instagram one is pretty much all the digital dream art. Uh, my website is science and books and everything. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Deirdre. That was fascinating. It's really nice to see what you've been working on recently. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers. I feel like we just went through, you know, a tour where we started out in, you know, the hard science and we've ended up in this fantastical world of dreams. That was super fun. Um, so thanks to all of you. Before we get to the questions that we have coming in, and by the way, there is still time to submit questions. So please keep typing them in if you haven't submitted yours yet. Um, we would like to publish the results of the poll that we took at the beginning. Um, so those results should pop up shortly. Okay, it looks like <coughs> none of the above is the winner, which is probably a good thing considering most of these are terrible dreams, um, except for flying. And that, I guess, depends on how you feel about flying. <laughs> um, to the panelists, have, have any of you had any of these dreams recently? What was your most recent dream? I guess that's the question I wanted to start out with, then we can get to some of the audience ones. Um, I, I only had those two. They were both in March as the pandemic was coming. And I think my first one was about me being scared of it. And my second one, I think my cat was kind of standing in for my worry about my students and just everyone else in the world who couldn't shelter yeah. at home as safely. And since then, I've dreamed about my survey about the pandemic. I've dreamed about making digital art. I've dreamed about all these other things, but both mine were back in, in March that really dealt with it. Mm, interesting. I'm a commercial pilot and flight instructor, so it's not surprising I dreamt of flying. Kind of trivial. <laughs> that's like the most boring kind of dream you could have <laughs> it's every day yeah. <laughs> yeah i i had a dream in march also it's interesting i think that was a time when all of us had our lives transformed and so in the dream i i won't go into all the details but i was climbing up to the very top of a very tall ladder onto a totally new platform where 
I was, I finally got on there and had to redefine my, I think I really had to redefine my whole life in symbolic terms. So I think we're all facing that now. Absolutely. Um, okay, Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you to get some of these, many of the audience questions that we have in. Yeah, thank you. We have a lot of questions. I'm going to start with a question that's for all of the speakers. So feel free to just jump in if you have an answer. Um, and the question is, do young kids or old people dream more or how does aging affect dreaming? Um, dreams increase through childhood. Early children don't recall as many and at the really young end it gets a little complicated whether they can't recall or they can't report. But, but dream recall increases up to kind of late childhood like 10, 11, 12 and then it plateaus slightly, stays up through early adulthood and then begins a very slow decline throughout life in average numbers. But but I want to emphasize that the, the age effects are still rather small compared to some other individual differences. There are some elderly people who recall way more dreams than a particular child may, but, but big averages, it, it goes up for a little while and then a very subtle decline. Yeah, I was, saying, uh, oh, go ahead, no. I was going to say that exactly parallels uh, REM sleep and memory. Uh, so REM sleep is where you have the most vivid dreams, even though it's not the only place you have dreams. Uh, children uh, initially have mostly uh, deep sleep or slow wave sleep, and that REM sleep comes up with exactly the same timeline that Deirdre mentioned. One of the confounding factors with people, the elderly, especially in the last 20 years, is that if they are put on antidepressants, uh, some of the antidepressants cause very vivid and frequent dreaming. So people who actually didn't remember many dreams suddenly start to have what they call their Zoloft dreams. And they often don't like them. They actually, I've seen people who want to discontinue the medication because there's too much dreaming going on. Thing. Um, another question that might be somehow related that comes back a lot in with the audience is, do you have any thoughts or insights on precognitive dreams? So like dreams that are, you know, for uh, the, the example that was given here is a famous uh, Lincoln having dreamed of walking through the White House and coming upon in his own corpse two weeks before his assassination. I could say something about this. I'm, I'm, I'm by nature skeptical about precognitive dreams. And I noticed, I remember when, uh, I don't know, if, uh, when Reagan was shot, uh, he didn't get killed, but he was shot at, the next day, the New York Post said psychic had predicted that Reagan would be shot the day before it happened. But actually, you know, I, I feel like we don't test enough of the negative possibilities. So we don't hear every time a psychic pr uh, predicts something that doesn't come true. Uh, we only hear about it. And probably every night, somebody dreams of the president being shot. Um, so that so that's uh, a confounding factor of it. Having said that, I would say I have worked with at least one and maybe two people who have dreams that produce predictions or knowledge about my personal life that they can't possibly have had it any other way, and I don't understand how it happens, but I I eventually have to acknowledge that it does happen. Yeah, I'm sort of similarly impressed with some of the anecdotal and even my own experiences, but as a scientist, kind of skeptical. And I, I do think that humans underestimate the likelihood of coincidences, that a one in a million chance 
will happen if there are a million possible, you're dreaming of this person and this person, you know, many people a night and many places a night, and you notice the ones that correspond to something and not the others. There was a dream registry once where they were trying, people were going to send in anything that would get in the news, earthquakes and natural disasters and things like that. And they did not find a higher rate of particular types of events shortly before they happened in the waking world, even though anecdotally, I mean, I certainly hear these, I know two different people who dreamed about planes crashing into tall buildings in New York City right before it happened. I mean, the anecdotes, and again, including some of my own experiences, gut level, they feel like they have to be meaningfully connected, but I think if you do the math, they don't have to be. And so, Deirdre, how, how do you do to remember your dreams when you wake up, and, and how do you, do you do to translate all of your dreams into your work of art? Um, the, actually, the ones I make the art from are just, they're very vivid. I wouldn't forget them easily, but but in general about my dreams and advice for people who maybe don't recall dreams as readily as I do is, first of all, if you suggest to yourself as you're falling asleep that you want to remember your dreams, that's helpful. But mostly when you wake up in the morning, if you have a way to record them, pad and pen or just your smartphone to dictate into, it's important to lie still and if you, if you recall a dream, tell it to your phone and that will tend to fix it in your memory so you don't even necessarily need the, the voice to text thing you've made. Um, but if you don't recall a dream right away, if you just stay with whatever you first wake up with, maybe you're vaguely thinking about your brother or you're a little sad, often whatever's there, if you feel it, a dream will come rushing back. Oh yeah, I'm feeling sad because I dreamed my brother had this terrible thing happen. And if you turn your attention to anything else, and especially if you get up and move around, the, the dream memory is just there in short-term memory and you have to focus on it to get it transferred into long-term. So mostly, pay it good attention first thing when you wake up, but kind of remind yourself just as you're falling asleep too, that it's a goal. Thank you. I also have a question for Mark. Um, if you say that an idea may come out of the blue, how can we know that it came from a dream and not from an actual previous experience? You can't. Uh, you can't necessarily know that. Um, sometimes people, after the fact, remember having had a dream connected to the idea. Uh, I mean, there are many examples in science, the man, or in technology, the man who invented the sewing machine had a dream in which he uh, was trying to come up with the idea of the bobbin and he saw a needle with a hole in it. And that allowed him to uh, use the dream to create the invention of the sewing machine. But I don't think a lot of times you may not ever know uh, where the inspiration came from. Thank you. Um, Stephen, um, my one of the clinical implications of your sleep research suggests the importance of sleep and trauma work, like that sleep is vital, vital to building new non-trauma related memories. Yep, uh, I think this was a question that someone named Carl asked, if I remember correctly. And it's an excellent idea. Uh, in fact, it's an idea that uh, I and a psychiatrist and a psychologist wrote a grant on that got funded, and we're working on it at the moment. The idea which uh, comes from uh, conventional psychology is that one could uh, perhaps use uh, the exploration of trauma-related dreams to uh, change their valence in, in much the way a psychotherapist might want to do in actual face-to-face uh, -face treatments. Uh, so yeah, it's a very good idea, and I don't know whether 
it will yield anything yet. In mice, we're attempting to understand this from a perspective of how do you, what actually happens at a cellular level when you change the valence of a dream. I'm sure you knew somebody uh, that you used to like that now you hate, or maybe vice versa. What's actually happening in your brain at a cellular level when you decide this person that was so fantastic isn't, or vice versa. Uh, for a mouse, you can kind of do that based on social hierarchy. Mice like to pick on each other. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're experimenting with. Is there an animal that doesn't sleep or do all animals have dreams? So I guess it, this depends on where you start to define an animal. I mean, technically, uh, uh, some very primitive single-celled organisms are classified as animals. And I think it would be a long way toward asking whether these animals uh, are dreaming. Uh, it's even a long way to ask whether these animals are sleeping. What we can say is that just about all, all organisms we've looked at have periods of time during which they do one set of things and periods of time during which they do another set of things. And if you think of sleep in that way, it's a time when your cells are doing something that they're not doing when you're awake. Uh, and uh, so will you qualify this as sleep? Maybe, maybe not. It's a very gray answer. Uh, but all the things with neurons that we have looked at seem to have some kind of sleep. Uh, dreams, again, it's very hard to tell whether an, even an animal that's very close to us, like a mouse, is dreaming. Uh, I would love to know whether fruit flies dream and people are trying to do the same sorts of experiments in mice now in flies and they have reported some success, but it's not fully convincing yet, though uh, I would bet it's true. And I'd like to add my favorite factoid about animal dreaming, which is that although most mammals like us show a, a cycle of non-REM sleep and then rapid eye movement sleep, and personally, I guess they're doing their version of a little doggy dream when a dog is in REM, but except for Coco the gorilla, no animal's ever been queried of dreams, and Penny Patterson may overinterpret that a bit, but she claims Coco told her dream accounts. But there are a few animals whose sleep cycle is so different from ours that whether you'd call things dreams is in question. Whales and dolphins sleep with one side of their brain at a time. If they need to do something they need full alertness for, the sleeping side wakes up, but they can come to the surface and breathe and kind of swim in the right direction. And uh, it's something like, there's something called the water test in humans where they put half of your brain to sleep briefly. So they must be having some completely different state of consciousness as they sleep than we do. Actually, not necessarily. So, so that local sleep is a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, exactly as uh, you stated. But humans, even though they can't shut off half their hemisphere and use the other, uh, these waves I mentioned can be local phenomena. And so, for example, if I immobilize a subject's arm and have them throw a ball against the wall with the other, the motor cortex uh, that is being controlled by, uh, that is controlling that arm is going to sleep more deeply and show more of these waves than the motor cortex from the immobilized side. And micro sleep events happen that even last uh, a half a second in which you see these waves uh, very briefly. Uh, and the more a subject gets tired, this is a study that's been done in medical students that end up uh, systematically deprived of sleep. They're even having micro sleep events while talking with patients. Yeah, I'm sure that some of our audience has probably had the experience either of when you first wake up in the morning, all your brain areas don't quite wake up at the same time and there's some confusion or you still see something from a dream for, for a moment in hypnagogic hallucinations or when you're really 
drowsy and part of your brain dozes in class and another doesn't. I, I think most of us have had those, those kind of partially asleep. Possibly some of the audience right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and another question from the audience that, that we like. Um, is it possible that using the Google Dream program could affect our dreams? Um, yes, although I, I don't know if it would affect them sort of based on its deep similarity to that. I would imagine that might be more true for the computer scientists who developed it and the ones who really understand it and study it in its details that what it is actually doing to kind of learn and then recreate out of these past images that may influence the the people doing the computer science of it it shows up in my dreams just the way anything that i look at and do a lot in waking life i mean i I picked it to resemble some things in some dreams that I had, but um, a number of people asked me, are you sure these are not drug images rather than dream images? And, and I'm well aware that, that it looks a little more psychedelic than, than my average dream images, but I have noticed that my dream images not only influence what I used to see art modes, but it's cer I certainly have more dreams where I kind of see like I'm in one of these um, merged object and kind of the sparkly look that it tends to, to get from not having the same boundaries. And S Steve mentioned um, the possibility of changing the emotional content of dreams talking about emotions, like how can we influence our dreams or how do, we, how do our emotions or like our beliefs or, you know, spiritual beliefs influence our dreams? I guess that would be for one of the others. I can give you a very concrete way that we're trying to influence human dreams and it's through odors you still smell just fine while you're asleep. And so the idea is to associate a particular odor with a particular content that we want to bring into uh, the, uh, the dream or the traumatic memory or the whatever. And now to uh, give the, we can detect by uh, MRI when that uh, dream might be happening and now to give the person that odor either in phase with the dream or not in phase with the dream and see whether the in phase treatment uh, results in an improvement of uh, the uh, traumatic reported content of the dream. And so that clearly uh, is something very concrete and odor, uh, but that is at least what we are trying to do. The basic idea seems to work for pure declarative memory. How many words can you remember? How many cards can you remember? Things like this, whether it will affect, whether it will help someone suffering from trauma is a different question entirely. Some people have been cultivating the ability to have lucid dreams, which is dreams that you are conscious of dreaming while they're happening. And some lucid dreamers are able to actually direct the content of their dreams and make them come out differently. So uh, not everybody can do this and it's unclear uh, to what degree it can be trained, but that is one way that people have, who've been having very frightening dreams have tried to master the emotions or even change the outcome of the dream. Yeah, one of the things I write about in pandemic dreams, I tend to work all with just self-suggestion right as you're falling asleep. It's a suggestible time. It's close, close in time to dreams. So for people just having too many anxiety dreams, 
I, I tend to tell them to think of what dream you would like to have, you know, see a favorite person, be in a favorite spot, maybe you like flying dreams, and fall asleep telling yourself you want to have that dream. And in one of my research studies, 50% of college students trying to dream on a particular topic succeeded. So it doesn't, doesn't work all the time, but it works a lot better than chance. And then for Post-traumatic nightmares, there are these techniques called mastery dreams or rescripting, where coming up with a different ending to the recurring nightmare, it only works if it's like the same dream all the time unfolding. So ahead of time, you can write this other script where you rescue yourself or someone comes along and rescues you or the outcome is very different. And that's been proved to be very effective in changing post-trauma nightmares. Now, those are things you do ahead of time, but I know there's some research, like Steve LaBerge has tried not only bedtime suggestions to become lucid, but having a, a detector of REM activate a voice recorder that says, Stephen, you're dreaming, you know, as, as he's in rapid eye movement sleep. And so some of those outside technologies do do seem possible to do even more than the bedtime self-suggestion. Well, um, as usual, the conversation really gets going when we have to wrap up. That's the nature of laser <laughs> talks. Uh, it's, it's a place where conversations start. And I hope that all of you out there continue the conversations we've had here today. Um, Thank you so much, Mark, Stephen, and Deirdre for sharing your work with us and uh, talking about all things sleep and dreaming. Um, we could go on for hours. We have to cut it off now, but, but thank you so much for your presentations and thank you to everyone who's tuned in. It's been wonderful to have you all here. Um, both Swiss Snacks and Sire Initiative have many virtual events going on. Um, we would also be having physical events too. Uh, so in the future, you can look forward to those. If you'd like to stay up to date with both organizations activities, please visit our websites, join our mailing list, follow us on social media. Uh, many people have asked if there's going to be a recording of this, there will be. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channels in the coming days. Um, so uh, in a one Quick last note, our next laser event will be sometime in September. Stay tuned for details on that one. Um, but for now, yeah, thank you to everyone for joining us. This was wonderful and fascinating. Definitely some food for thought for the rest of the day and, and possibly in our dreams tonight. <laughs>